Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportuni opportunity today to speak a little bit about the late medieval underpinnings of the Salome story as expressed in the medium of music. Of course, the character of Salome does not emerge, as we know, without the presence of the precursor of Jesus, John the Baptist. In my presentation today, I'd like to highlight a medieval conception of the Baptist and then move to some musical works that draw out his character in the soundscape of the 13th and 14th centuries. Moving closer to the dancing girl herself, never called Salome in the sources I've surveyed, I'll share what I've found in Christian liturgies for John concerning the scene of the beheading. I'll examine not the liturgies of John's nativity, but rather those for the decollation or beheading of the Baptist, in which the popular narrative that includes Salome surfaces. Although these liturgies have been treated as texts, most of their contents were chanted in unison, and so it's appropriate to expose you to the musical shape of these works as we take note of the relevant texts. Finally, I'll draw attention to a piece of choral music that alludes to the decollation, but also has some very special musical properties that have gone unnoticed by scholars. For all of today's musical illustrations, I'm very fortunate to be joined by a group of talented singers here in the front row from the Eastman School of Music, many of whom, all of whom, sing uh, this kind of material on a weekly basis uh, with the Schola Cantorum of Christ Church in Rochester. And we will intersperse singing in the presentation, in effect creating these live examples. I'd like to start by presenting an image of the Baptist in late medieval culture and then refining it with an idea that brings music into the picture. Because John's life is given in the Gospels, his character was firmly etched in Christian memory with several traits that were easily adopted into visual culture. As relayed most vividly in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, which we've heard about, the Baptist led an ascetic lifestyle and conducted his ministry in the wilderness. His ruggedness was captured enduringly in the image of his coarse clothing made of camel hair and his diet of uh, locusts and wild honey. John is clearly identifiable in scenes of Jesus' baptism by these markers of outward appearance, an appearance, by the way, that would stand in stark contrast to Salome's physical beauty. Here we see the characteristics in a suffrage, so a devotional picture to a saint, uh, from an English book of hours from the first quarter of the 15th century. Another image permanently fastened in the Christian imagination is John's connection to Jesus as the Lamb of God, growing out of the biblical testimony, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John chapter 1, verse 29. In approaching the subject of John the Baptist in their works, medieval and Renaissance artists often inscribe the Ecce Onius Dei, the Latin text, on banners, sometimes with the saint physically pointing his finger to, uh, to Christ, to a lamb, or to these uh, prophetic words. We have this here again in the same image, the banner and the finger pointing, if you will. John's notorious beheading at the banquet of Herod the Tetrarch was, of course, another important scene involving the precursor saint, primed for artistic renderings, as we have seen many times already today. John the Baptist is a special figure in the Christian West for being celebrated on two feast days, June 24th, his nativity, and August 29th, uh, his beheading. June 24th was also a festival uh, day of midsummer, the celebration of the summer solstice, uh, as it was believed then, the longest day of the year. This, uh, this day, midsummer day, was well known as a day of solar crisis. At that moment in the year, the length and power of sunlight were at their greatest and would diminish for the next six months. The festival day was celebrated with an array of traditional activities, including the lighting of bonfires, the celebration of nature's foliage, which would have been at its peak, the gathering of a curative dew, and the public repudiation of authority, emulating the day of reversal. These midsummer rituals commemorating the turning point in the year were in full force in the late Middle Ages, and some vestiges of these public festivities are still in practice today. 
The Feast of John's Nativity marked a crucial moment in the liturgical year, exactly halfway until Christmas, Jesus' birth, and was legitimated thereby uh, in the rhythms of nature, which could be internalized by believers on Midsummer Day. In this period, sacred and secular profitably converge and collapse the space between popular and elite traditions. The commingling of sacred and profane are seen in the late Middle Ages in a musical genre called the motet, which is an unusual creation rooted in a liturgical melody or tenor as the foundation, coupled with newly composed voices and texts in parts above that voice. In the last two decades, medieval musicologists have sufficiently demonstrated that the texts of the upper voices in the motet corpus often expound uh, the tenors on which they're constructed. If one examines the two dozen or so motets for John the Baptist in the 13th century repertory, aside from the uh, Latin texts that describe the events uh, in his life, there are motets that deliver specific images related to those secular rituals surrounding his feast, such as the lighting of bonfires and the criticism of authority. This is typical of the motet, which famously had the capacity to blend weighty sacred genres or registers with light and heady ones. We can begin with two motets rooted in a single melody sung on the nativity feast of John the Baptist. But first, the tenor melody upon which these motets are constructed, which is an excerpt of an alleluia for that nativity feast shown here. It's a melody set to just one word, Johanne. Here I'm focused on the right part of the screen. Uh, John, Johanne. Uh, the verse of this is biblical, translating alleluia. Uh, among those born of women, none has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Uh, that's Matthew 11, 11. And we'll sing this uh, melody first. First motet I'd like to submit on this melody, Johanne, John, is Virgo Mater Salutis, found in a mid 13th century source, one of the central manuscripts of polyphonic music emanating from Paris at that time. The upper voice, uh, there is only one voice above the tenor melody here, features an unequivocal supplication to the Virgin Mary. But near the end of the text, the supplicants ask Christ via Mary, to heal the wounds of blame and put out the godless conflagration of those struggling and so forth. This is no ordinary text at this point, a godless conflagration. 
And as I've said, one of the most storied activities associated with John's Midsummer Feast Day was the lighting of uh, fires. Other fire rituals occurred on the feast as well. Uh, you had the, a the act of leaping over large flames, also uh, the rolling of a fiery wheel of straw down a hill. Uh, uh, and in light of these extensive fire rituals then known to be associated with St. John's Day, the isolated and conspicuous allusion to a conflagration in this motet uh, should give us pause to consider a connection to the seemingly distant Johanne tenor and the implications of the festival day. The mention of fire alone is in fact quite rare in the uh, motets of the 13th century. None of them repeating the phrase uh, or anything close to it, godless conflagration. Uh, this formulation does, however, appear in Ovid's Metamorphoses, befitting its pagan origin. The music for this motet is even marked for importance when mention of the conflagration occurs. At the very moment that the upper voice sings extingat incendium, put out that fire, uh, uh, the composer breaks the established confines of the customary musical range in the upper voice, allowing it to ornament that first syllable of the word incendium with clarity due to the absence of the tenor uh, singing there. You see the little rest there. And now we'll sing that one. texted upper voice a new text and this melody down here is the same one that Aaron sang from that chant it's just been rhythmically activated it's been made into a dancing melody instead of a sort of a timeless chant I also mentioned that criticism oh no I that can't be right it is right I'm moving so many parts here <laughs> open book Click, read. Um, I also mentioned that criticism of, of, of authority was another ritual associated with the feast of John the Baptist and its coincidence with Midsummer. And of course, this also fits well with the beheading, which had its own festal commemoration. As the sun changes course in the solar year, the public was justified in turning culture on its head, rejecting authority as much as one could in the late Middle Ages. 13th century Parisian motets speaking out against corruption do, in fact, survive, but they are few and far between. Therefore, the occurrence of two corruption texts, one Latin, one French, on the tenor Johanne uh, appears all the more conspicuous. The motet, Ne se que je dis et en fuevilini, and another text, uh, Latin text, Cecitas arpie fex hypocrisie, constitute an important connection to the criticism, the general criticism rituals associated with the Midsummer Feast. The Latin, Cecitas Arpie, Fex Hypocrisie, features a more admonitory tone than the French piece, but more importantly, some two generations after the compilation of uh, the source of the French motet, the Latin motet now with a new variant first syllable, veritas RPA, fex hypocrisie, on that tenor, Johanne, would be included in the Roman de Fauvel, uh, the early 14th, 14th century satire detailing the imagined effects of complete political and ecclesiastical upheaval in France. The authors of Fauvel are uh, intimately familiar with the political ramifications of the Midsummer Feast, knew exactly where to look for criticism material. Both corruption motets are, in fact, 
not just superficially critical of uh, secular and sacred authority through the direct references in the upper voices, but they are hardwired to serve this purpose through association with that melody, Johanne, and all of its implications. The compilers of the Roman deftly positioned Veritas RPA, Fexi Pacrosie, within the roll call section of the manuscript where 49 allegorical vices, like carnality and envy and sloth and all those bad things, um, are named as courtiers of Favel. Reminiscent of some of the texts by Philip the Chancellor, Veritas RPA is notable for its critical stance, drawing on Old Testament uh, references to remind the nameless perpetrators that the reward in heaven will be lost should they continue their errant behavior in church office. The separate allusions to uh, Goliath and Uriah the Hittite suggest the imminent downfall of the corrupt ones rebuked in the upper voice text. And now we will sing this little thing. same Johanne tenor is there. It's just, it looks a little different. It's in longer notes, but it's still there. It's all based on that. Although criticizing authority was a midsummer ritual, it's obviously at the root of the beheading narrative at the banquet of Herod the Tetrarch, widely observed in the August 29th feast day. Salome is not mentioned in the canonical sources, but she is, of course, named in the first century uh, uh, by Josephus in the Jewish, uh, the Jewish antiquities. I'd like to take this time now to understand where that decollation narrative stood in the late Middle Ages and the role of the dancing girl within it. And for this, I'd like to turn to a well-known encyclopedia of saints and feasts that became uh, one of the most widely disseminated books of that time, The Golden Legend, by mid-13th century Dominican uh, Jacobus de Veragine. Saints' lives were told and retold in highly circulated legends, but Veragine's Golden Legend was copied incessantly and thus provides an important glimpse of medieval perceptions of things like the decollation. Faragine lists four events associated with the feast of the beheading of John the Baptist. The first, the beheading itself. The second, the collection and cremation of the saint's bones. Third, the finding of his head, sometimes called the invention. And finally, the translation of one of his fingers and the dedication of a church in his honor. And we'll concern ourselves with the first of these, of course, the beheading itself, as the other three focus on, on relics of the saint. Faragine takes as his source the scholastic history of the 12th century French theologian Petrus Comestor. In this account, Herod, upon his return from a journey uh, to Rome, took Herodias away from his brother Philip. This contrasts with what we heard earlier that Herodias picked up and left. Um, then the Baptist ent enters the picture. John the Baptist took Herod to task for this on the grounds that according to the law, he had no right to marry his brother's wife while his brother was alive. Herod throws the Baptist into prison, not only for his descent, but also because of John's large following. The account continues. Indeed, both Herodias and Herod longed to find an opportunity to get rid of John and they seem to have arranged secretly between themselves that Herod would invite the leading men of Galilee to a banquet in honor of his birthday and would have Herodias' daughter dance for them, after which Herod would swear to give anything she asked for, and she would ask for the head of John. On account of this oath, he would have to grant her request, but would pretend to be saddened because he had sworn so. And this differs with some things we've heard as well. I mean, this is almost turned on its head. Um, these acts are, of course, carried out. 
Herod is secretly delighted at the event and feigns sadness, being true to his vow to the girl. The headsman is sent, the Baptist is decapitated, the head is given to the daughter, she in turn gives it to her mother, uh, and that's Viragine's account. Uh, no, no big surprises, and, and certainly no named girl. These basic details from Faragine are echoed in the life of John the Baptist as narrated through the sonic medium of the divine office. The office repertoire con consists of texts set to music for a celebration of a given feast, like the Decolation Feast, broken up across eight canonical hours of the Western liturgical day. Thousands of liturgical books survive with and without music for the nativity of John the Baptist on June 24th, the decollation of John, though not nearly the rank of uh, his nativity, uh, festal rank, feast rank, but is still present in numerous sources, allowing us to track some broad trends in the survival of chants for the feast. And more importantly, the narratives unfolded in the office as it concerns the story of the beheading. You don't have to squint. <laughs> Uh, the Cantus database project has cataloged offices from 138 liturgical books. Out of these 138 sources, 81 contain an office for the decollation, and these are spread quite wide uh, geographically. A number of chants found in the offices for the beheading are transmitted in the, very, in the oldest layer of offices known to us. The oldest office in the Cantus uh, database is the uh, for the feast in question, is found in the French manuscript Albi Bibliothèque Municipale uh, Roche Guda 44, which has nine chants for the feast of the decollation, limited to two services, matins uh, performed in the middle of the night, and lauds at daybreak. This source is from a cathedral, the Cathedral of Saint-Cécile in Albi in the south of France, just northeast of Toulouse. It lacks musical notation and is, can be dated around uh, 890. But what to do with this unwieldy set of 81 sources and the offices for John's beheading contained in them outside of just finding the oldest one? There are really two ways I think we can look at the surviving materials for the decollation. First, we can generate something of a master template, a single ideal type of an office that accounts for the most frequently encountered chants in the liturgical day across uh, late medieval Europe. This is a risky proposition, since the central problem in, in chant studies involves accounting for the variance of chant across geographies. But I'd like to propose uh, simply that in doing an exercise like this, I'm interested in finding the chants with the highest levels of circulation, which is to say the most concordances of those cataloged. Tapping the very useful synoptic table in the Cantus database, one can develop a sense of what chants appear with frequency in certain positions in the office for the decollation. Here we see a list of chants and their frequency in set positions across the 81 sources that bear the feast. Clearly, there are a few chants that are found repeatedly in the same position in the offices accounted for. We are drawn to the daybreak office of lauds, which in practice has five antiphons or short melodies with psalms attached to them, and another antiphon paired with the Benedictus, the canticle of Zechariah. This is the most stable configuration of chants across Western European sources and is worth touching on just briefly. If we zoom in a little bit on this, if we zoom in a lot, <laughs> On this same chart, one notices within the uh, Office of Lauds that the chant Da Miki in Disco Caput, down here, uh, seems to be doubled as antiphons four and five. Clearly, we are working with two fairly evenly split traditions, one which reliably has this short piece in the fourth position, and another tradition in which the piece is relegated to the fifth spot. Let us probe the most prevalent antiphons here and the one for the Benedictus Miso Herodes Spiculatore um, here. And now if we rearrange the antiphons in the order which they hypothetically occurred, we can see, for instance, whether a narrative unfolds um, and, and whether there's any special musical uh, characteristics at play. The idea of an antiphon these short melodies, whether in the service of lauds or elsewhere in the 
liturgical day is to narrate the history of the event being celebrated in a style that is not musically overbearing, not full of long, melodious passages, the anti-Strauss. Um, <laughs> instead, set syllabically in an almost conversational style. So how is the story told here? Very briefly, the first antiphon, the most stable of all the chants for John's decollation feast, tells us that Herod imprisoned John because Herodias told him to do so. This is followed in antiphon number two by the mother, uh, not named this time, commanding her daughter, qualified by her dance, to ask for John's head. Nothing more than that, very highly condensed. The third and fourth antiphons are quite similar. No longer is there na narration, but actual speaking. Uh, not really typical uh, for the office. Number three, number antiphon three here. O Lord, my king, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Number four is nearly redundant. Give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Followed by the comment about how the king was saddened um, uh, by, by his vow. We have no idea whether he was feigning sadness either, and we have no hypothetical fifth antiphon to tell us more because we saw it was doubled above. The final antiphon, which contains a recitation of the canticle Zechariah, which I haven't put in here, is a highlight of any laud service. In this, but in this ideal type office, we find not a summary of John's story, uh, some kind of grand statement, but a continuation of the narrative, repeating some of the text from the last antiphon, and adding that the disciples of the Baptist carried off John's body and put it in a tomb. This piece is the second most stable piece across all decollation offices. So if churches and monasteries uh, were celebrating the feast of the decollation, they were likely to be singing this piece. Another way to slice the data that we have from the decollation office is to sing, uh, to examine, I'd like to sing, uh, to examine a single representative source. And for this, one could look at France Bibliothèque Nationale, Manuscript Latin 12044. Here we have the actual services for the feast from an early 12th century liturgical book from the monastery of saint maur de fosse just southeast of uh, Paris. Why did I choose this one? Uh, in short, simply, of the earliest offices we have for the decollation, this one is the most extensive. 57 chants, and I'm just showing you fif uh, about 15 of them here. In this case, we can witness the full shape of a real office instead of a manufactured or a theoretical one. And I'd like to point out that the antiphons of Lauds uh, in this 12044 manuscript almost perfectly match our ideal type uh, from earlier. What is now settled is that we have a fifth antiphon that is no longer hypothetical, but real. In the fifth Lauds antiphon of this office, we're told that King Herod dispatched his ministers to decapitate John in his place of imprisonment, a logical piece of the narrative to follow the request of the dancing girl. I'd like to sing through those six antiphons in the order they would have occurred in the Lord's service at daybreak. The first five would have been accompanied by the recitation of a psalm, and we will do a full psalm, Psalm 128 from the Vulgate, with the first antiphon, and then we'll just do the rest without psalms. We'll, we'll spare you, um, although they're great. <laughs> The final antiphon contains a recitation of the canticle of Zechariah, which we'll also allude to and then proceed to omit. Um, you can see the translation of the antiphon on the screen if I remember to change them. If, so I've got to remember, because <laughs> I'm singing this too. Uh, the dancing girl was mentioned directly in the second antiphon of Lawns, as I mentioned. Uh, the dialogue in Antiphons 3 and 4 are also presumably from the mouth of Salome. Musically, these Antiphons are a little unpredictable in terms of their resting tones or home keys. And I say that because sometimes in the offices we see a very calculated ascent through the eight melodic modes or home keys uh, of the Antiphons in successions, but not here. Okay? So now it's time to sing these. Herod is an intenuit as we gave you all. 
et posuit in carcerem protere rodiae. Se per expunia verunt me abadulescentia mea, dicat nunc Israel, se per expunia verunt me abadulescentia mea, Sed non potu erunt mihi, super servis meam narrabant arantes. Prolonga verum sul cum sul, Dominus Iusus consilet, Laqueos impiorum, Confundantur et revertantur et rorsum. Omnes qui oderum sion, Fian sicut felum tectorum. Quod statimut virum editar eset, De quona implebit manum suam meso. Et sinum suum manipulos faciens, De quona dixerunt transeuntes. Benedictio Domini, Super vos benedictimus vobis in nomine Domini, Gloria Patri et Filio, et Spiritu e Sancto, sicuterat in principio et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Erole seim tenuit et ligavit Ioannem, et posuit in carcerem propter Herodiade.
continue uh, the canticle. Just the Benedictus is to lauds what the Magnificat is to Vespers. It's a real high point of the service. So there it was. Okay. Have I think we have you stand. Okay. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Having done this quick tour of the service of lauds, I'd like to add that Herodias's daughter is mentioned two other times in the services of this manuscript 12044. She appears in the night office of Matins in an antiphon that kicks off a set of responsories. Here you get a peek at how the manuscript looks as well. Um, the notation is very clear, easy to transcribe and derive. The translation here, the girl begged for John's head on a platter. This having been accepted, she gave it to her mother. The final mention of the girl, uh, we know as Salome, is one of the more elaborate musical expressions in the office. It's a responsory, which usually signals a mellifluous outpouring of music relative to the antiphonal, uh, modest style you've just heard several times. The text is a bit more extensive than we've seen, but no surprising details are revealed. The mother commanded the dancing girl nothing else but to ask for John's head, and the king was saddened on account of this vow and lay down. That, the Latin's really bad there. She, uh, having emerged, spoke to her mother asking for the head of John the Baptist. Here, a soloist is given the verse of the, re verse of the responsory, the more elaborate style not fit for communal uh, singing and psalm recitation uh, by the choir. take the short repeat so you didn't miss anything we went back we went back and they don't repeat the whole thing because that would take too long it's the middle of the night and they want to get back to sleep it's true <laughs>
There's more to say about this office, to be sure, as it concerns the decollation uh, narrative, whether it's the unfolding of liturgical items, theoretically across the entire day, we just gave you a little piece, the conspicuous borrowing of musical works from the nativity to go into this office, um, and, and other things. In the interest of time, though, I should like to turn finally to a piece of polyphonic music, choral music, that is extraordinary in its design and highlights John the Baptist. Uh, this is an anonymous piece of music for four voice parts, a bit richer than what we've seen so far, um, with two texts sung simultaneously. It is uh, titled O Amicus Sponsi. Uh, the other voice has a poetry that begins with the word precursores. And it can be found in a turn of the century, turn of the 15th century manuscript called the Yoxford Manuscript, once held in private possession and now archived in the Suffolk Record Office. In an overview of the late medieval motet, Margaret Bent pointed out that motets from the 14th century onward began to display symbolic relationships, often motivated by text and emblematic numbers. This motet is special because of its theological symbolism for the Baptist. The texts given to the upper voices are about the forerunner, uh, John the Baptist, and seem to have determined the extraordinary design and interesting repetition schemes in this work. The composer of O Amicus Sponsi set the two lowest voice, voices in this piece called tenor and contratenor into a canon, literally following a rule or a prescription for how to operate based on an uncomplicated six-note melody, possibly a segment of plain chant, but we can't be sure, um, likely chosen for its simplicity and pliability. A remarkable thing happens in, the bottom two in these bottom two voices in addition to the canon. They both sing the same melody um, at different locations, at different places transposed, uh, but the two proceed at different paces so that one sings faster or ahead of the other and is then eclipsed by it. They don't have any text, by the way. This ingenious foundation for the work of kind of going ahead and pulling back uh, with each voice beautifully encapsulates the theology surrounding uh, John the Baptist. As you, uh, you see, when while John's disheveled appearance and, and the desert scenes were very easy to portray in art, it was quite a challenge to represent the idea that the Baptist ministry would cede to Christ, uh, memorably captured in the declaration, he must increase, I must decrease, from John uh, chapter 3, verse 30. The compositional maneuver here is accomplished by a special use of red notes, and I've just colored them red because I didn't want to make red notes, um, that signal one of the voices to read the notes 50% longer than its uh, partner voice, kind of slowing it up, if you will. We know this, by the way, we know to do this from reading the text of one of the upper voices, which is really clever. Uh, this so-called mensuration canon in O Amica Sponsi intensifies the connection between the technique and the precursor saint. As divulged in one of the, the text voices I said, not, not shown here, the contratenor one of those bottom voices, must read the tenor's notes in reverse coloration. And the reversal here signals an extension by the ratio of 2 to 3, so like 50% longer, when, ca when cast in red notation, not the usual 3 to 2 relationship, or hemiola, such, uh, that such coloration normally entails. In contrast to traditional canons, the bottom two voices of O Amicus Sponsi enter at a fifth apart and then become subject to this temporal manipulation by, oper by the operation of uh, reverse coloration in order to fill the musical space. In the first statement, the tenor reads its notation as normal, like in, in black, black notation, like there, um, while the contratenor imagines itself being red, uh, being R-E-D. Uh, so actually, it, that part is not actually written. It doesn't need to be. Uh, thus making them elongated by half, just like a dot would add 50% to uh, the length of a note. Um, thereby slowing down its pace of, the, of the, the foundational melody. In the middle of the statement by the tenor, 
uh, the contratenor reverses and, and uh, loses its no notation. The, the tenor then reads red, the contratenor reads black, um, and it lets the voices catch up to each other. Pretty simple, but also pretty ingenious. Um, that the anonymous composer produced these effects through a rare use of reverse coloration, not regular coloration, uh, may also be significant and invites hermeneutical speculation. Despite its roots in the early 14th century sources like the Roman de Favel, the technique of coloration to indicate a, a, a change of, uh, measure of time or, or mensuration was scarcely employed for the remainder of the century. This makes the appearance of Oomica, its appearance in Oomica Sponsi all the more remarkable. The execution of the red coloration in the two to three instead of the three to two ratio would seem to seal the uniqueness of this method and may call to mind John's uh, calendrical significance, his nativity being situated at that moment of solar crisis directly opposite of uh, December 28th uh, for Christmas. It would further be enticing to see the uncommon use of red, expressly red coloration in the lower voices as having implications for the Baptist. Red is the universal symbol for fire and blood, uh, two images that customarily have special meaning uh, for, for this saint. Uh, while the ubiquitous practice of lighting St. John's fires finds no place in the text of Oomica Sponsi, the redness of the tenor and contratenor might connote the blood of the victim whose martyrdom plays no small role uh, in the motet. Although uh, one of the, and it's a lot of text in here, uh, although one of the texted upper voices surveys John's life, the very first stanza suggests that the crime of Herod and the subsequent death of the Baptist will be crucial events in the narrative that I may tell of the crime that ended his life. The imaginative use of red coloration thus may take on special significance as John's head is severed at the request of a girl. Our person of interest, this girl, is indeed mentioned, not for her dancing in the motet, but for her mere request. An ill omen feast gives his head cut off on the request of a girl. And now we will sing this, uh, this piece. And I've just provided the, the top voice text. The bottom, the kind of alto part here is the voice, is the voice that gives away how to execute the canon. Uh, but you, you just have to trust me, there's just too much text in this piece. OK.
<laughs> Hats off. That is, that is hard to <laughs> count that. <laughs> um, Admittedly, it can be hard to know where to draw the line with these possible allegories, given the claret, but given the clarity of emblems in uh, uh, contemporary iconography, the sonic representations might not be as arbitrary uh, to a performer or informed listener of the period as the modern analyst might assume. At minimum, the experimentation with an unusual form of coloration in Olomeka Sponsi is exceptional exposing aspects of a piece that inscribes John the Baptist in its musical construction as much as in its text. By way of, uh, by way of conclusion, I'd like to make a brief comment about the arts and the no notion of progress as it relates to Salome here. It's true that medieval and Renaissance artists were attracted to the topic of the beheading with all of its flavorful details we've seen uh, from Grace just earlier. Here the dancing girl is literally bending over backwards for the Tetrarch. But from what we have seen from the evidence of the offices, at least, Salome is nothing more than an unnamed girl. Uh, visual art seems to be ahead of music when it came to descriptions of the decollation. Way ahead, actually. Uh, but I've shown ahead. <laughs> but I've shown the fun world was laughing. It wasn't me. <laughs> But I've showed elsewhere cases in which music seems to have the leg up, whether in textual revelations or in depictions of John the Baptist that unfold time in a peculiar way that static visual material cannot. This is all to say that we should, of course, explore our topics from multiple angles and, and media in, full, in fully assessing them. And I'm delighted that this symposium has given us a chance to do just that. Thanks very much. In the Lod's um, succession, well, it's normally it should go one, two, three, four, and four is always a, a tough mode. No one wants to write in four, um, but it, it. I'll say this, you know, the fact that it uh, jumps around, you know, uh, what is it? I go look at it, but it basically is like two, two, three, five. You know, there's no order to it. That's always been uh, positioned as, well, it must be uh, taken from other places, that it actually didn't begin as such. Um, but the fact that it was so stable so early would seem to refute that. So I don't really. I think this is just not, usually I think it's the later offices that begin to be ordered when they start to crank them out with more, uh, or more often, and uh, for more saints. And this was just an, old, an older feast, the nativity being even older. Yes? Um, this is a question born of um, ignorance. How do you know, I know this has been an issue, so I'd like to know how it's been involved, what the uh, actual tone is, since there are no short or flats. The actual home key? Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually, for any given chant, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually too easy. Because it's it's too easy, um, and I'll pull up the right slide. It's the last note. <laughs> so right here, right before the solo sings the verse, E is the home key of this. Tonic, yeah. If you want to, if you want to get into <laughs> specialist language, <laughs> yeah. So it's just uh, it would be. You e. mean like what note you're actually singing? Yeah. Mean, like, oh, we're, we're pitching it. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Change, right? Yeah. Well. Some of these uh, chants, we were moving all over the place um, because we want to sing it where our voices are comfortable and not where they are written necessarily. Okay, so we see here, you know, middle uh, a C, um, and and we did sing it on C, but we could have well, if we had a tenor singing that, you know, we would have we would have moved it up because that's where it's comfortable. You have to just sort of see the range of the piece, know where you're starting it. And then, and then you adjust. But that's the key. How do you know? I mean, I, I once did research on the idea that a lot of early music uh, in Israel from 
European immigrants was written to sound like a European idea of maybe of a of a music. See what I mean? I so how do we know since there are no sharps or flats, how do we know uh, whether we are imposing our notion of medieval music on this sound or whether that's really you see what I'm trying to I see. Well, this uh, this system has a system of relationships that are, I guess, I, I we don't the period you're talking about. We don't have the notation to know. You don't have the accidentals, right? Well, we have the relationships. We have the relationships in later sources, and we keep going back. And maybe at the at the when we start losing notation, we still have the texts. Um, and so we we follow later sources to know those relationships. We can't prove their origins and the, but we see the relationships later and we figure there's oral tradition behind it to preserve pretty well. If not some of them, maybe microtones you're suggesting, but that's a wide open field. There's a wide open field about, about whether Chan is actually not best represented on the staff. That's a whole controversial hypothesis. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all.